Good morning. I love how in the Navy, when I say good morning, everybody says it back like we did in kindergarten. <laughs> it's totally awesome. Um, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It's really an honor for me to be here today. Um, before we get started, I'd like to pause to reflect on the terrible tragedy this weekend in Orlando. My heart goes out to the victims and the families. Yesterday, Secretary Mavis said, no act of terror can change who we are and the values that make us Americans. And I think that's an important reminder as we contemplate the theme of this conference uh, today. So with that in mind, it's an honor to be here. It's great to see some old friends. Uh, Andy Krepinevich, one of my mentors, you all are going to be very honored, very lucky to hear him speak today. I'm sure he's going to have all the answers for you, and then you won't have to have the rest of the conference. That's usually how it works. Um, uh, it's great to take a look at this, the theme of the conference today, strategy in complex and uncertain times. The strategic environment is indeed complex and uncertain. We need clear strategic thinking about the critical and enduring war role the United States Navy and Marine Corps play in support of American leadership in the world. So I want to take this opportunity today to propose a fairly practical policymaker approach to strategy to share with you how I think about strategy and its limitations. I'll tell you how strategy informs my work every single day in the Pentagon and how I hope the work that each of you are doing can help shape the future. So my job as Under Secretary of the Navy is to help translate the President's vision into something concrete. That is, to organize, train, and equip our Navy and Marine Corps to align with our nation's strategic objectives. Now this requires vision because, as the theme of this conference rightly points out, the future is always uncertain. Our strategic guidance from the President's National Security Strategy to the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman's Defense and Military Strategies collectively provide a framework for how to approach this task. But ultimately, it's up to the Secretary of the Navy and his team of advisors, including myself and the CNO and the Commandant, to determine what force structure design is best. This process is further complicated by the fact that the Pentagon's force development processes are complex, expensive, and very slow. Most of the ships, planes, and sexy new technologies that we're dreaming about and building today will not actually be in the hands of our sailors and Marines for another one or two decades. We tend to keep our ships and submarines and aircraft up to five decades, which drives the need for modernization in stride. My point here is that modernizing a force while also procuring the next generation of capabilities is slow and expensive, yet it is vital to introducing the state-of-the-art technologies. Many of our ships and planes fighting our current fights, even the ones that I flew, uh, were designed and built in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. The debates over these systems, their munitions and their con-ops began even earlier and were informed by lessons from the past, classic theorists, and even science fiction. The strategies, doctrines, and concepts of operations had been dreamed up, lessons had been learned, or as we discovered, sometimes unlearned, uh, by people like us, like you and me, in places like this. The littoral combat ship, the Virginia-class submarine, fifth-generation fighters, the Ford-class carriers were all designed after the fall of the Soviet Union when we assumed the world's oceans were free and open to American maritime power. As much as we try to predict the future, our platforms are still often a reflection of the times in which they're designed. In this case, we emphasized power projection capabilities over the need for sea control in contested waters. So today, as we think about our day-to-day -day work, mine and yours, I want us to remember we're not building a Navy just, or a Navy and Marine Corps, uh, for ourselves. We're building it for the next generation, for our children, and probably for our grandchildren. We must continually assess if we have the right balance in our concepts and in our fleet and future designs. So how do we begin? We begin with strategy. 
And I know we academics and policymakers like to talk about strategy, especially grand strategy. Linking ways and means to well-articulated ends is a very tidy construct. But alas, grand strategy of the sort we like to teach has nearly always been a frustrating and elusive endeavor. This is certainly more true today than in the Cold War, but let's not fool ourselves. Even then, when the Soviet Union and the terrifying threat of nuclear annihilation, American grand strategy and the role of, America's, of America in the world was still hotly debated. So today, like before, there is not total agreement on the exact ends, ways, and means of American strategy or even on America's role in the world. So let me offer my perspective into this debate. I'll tell you how I managed to cope with this perennial uncertainty and debate. Let me give you some of my ideas on where and how to place some thoughtful bets today to help shape and secure the future that we want. First, putting strategy to work. As I think through the type of Navy and Marine Corps we need in the future, I think about what we want that future to look like. And at a minimum, I think about what we are trying to preserve. Our security, our values, our very way of life. Although day to day most people can't feel it or touch it, it turns out that maintaining these things from Wall Street to Main Street requires a stable and cooperative global order. And we have had such an international system, one based on our values and the rule of law and free trade for over 70 years. It may not be perfect, but in light of the very bloody history of the world, it ain't too bad. Now, maintaining the status quo may not sound like a very sexy end state for a grand strategy, but consider the nature of the current global order and how that system benefits the United States and indeed the entire planet, how ex and how existentially at risk it currently is. The current rules-based global order is often taken for granted as though it is a natural set point for global affairs. But in fact, in so many ways, it is a most unnatural historical anomaly. The post-World War II system of international order, which includes things like the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations, began with the massive reconstruction of Europe and Japan and has been characterized by over 70 years of economic growth and development. Literally billions of human beings have been lifted out of poverty and desperation as a result of this system. And I do not think it's an overstatement. This massive reconstruction, growth, and development could only have been possible without, the, could not have been possible without the, kinds of, we've got, without the kinds of catastrophic wars fought in the first half of the 20th century. Wars this system was designed to prevent. So just because that's sort of a counterfactual observation, it does not make it any less true. When you travel abroad or live overseas, you know it. You feel it in your bones. The thing is that this system and the stability it provided was not an accident. It was carefully crafted and actively managed by the United States of America, along with its partners and allies. We did it with vision and through shrewd day-to-day -day diplomacy. And importantly, especially for this forum, with the relative peace and security guaranteed by the United States military. America's military has underwritten this unprecedented era by sustaining its lethal technological edge and, as Secretary Mavis points out, by being there. From the Fulda Gap in Europe to the sea lanes around the world, the lethality and the global presence of the American military has been indispensable. This epitomizes the wise observation of a former Assistant Secretary of the Navy and President, Teddy Roosevelt, when he said, a good Navy is not a provocation to war. It is the surest guarantee of peace. So I drag you through this short history, or IR lesson, as a reminder that we cannot take peace and world order for granted. The system is only as strong as our willingness to manage it, and in the unique case of the United States, to lead. If we see it as a natural set point and take our guard down, it could crumble. Our values in the rule of law, human rights, free trade, which are the foundation of our way of life, define this global order and are the fruits of global stability. So today this system is under threat and indeed active attack. 
It is threatened by transnational challenges like climate change, refugees, migration, piracy, economic shocks, global pandemics, and violent extremism, all of which require cooperative international strategies to address. Yet no one nation, not even the United States, can solve problems like these by flying solo. But even though the United States cannot solve all of these global challenges and uphold a global order on its own, we retain a unique and preeminent leadership role. The fact is, when we lead, others follow. And when we fail to lead, people don't often act. So while the system is being threatened from below and within by these transnational challenges, it is also under active attack by a couple nation states that probably understand the system's weaknesses and the degree to which it is dependent on the United States maybe a little bit better than we do. A rising China and a revanchist Russia, as well as Iran and North Korea, are challenging this order from many angles. Iran and North Korea present the horrifying threat of nuclear proliferation, while China and Russia have found ways to take and hold territory and strategies short using strategies short of classical military invasions. Using little green men in Crimea and dredges in the South China Sea, these two nation states are cleverly operating just short of what our international system calls war. And little by little, they are trying to redraw the maps and rewrite the rules. So at the operational level, Russia is now able to operate more aggressively from its bases in Crimea and Kaliningrad thus militarizing the Baltic and the Black Seas. And China is militarizing the South China Sea with new bases and artificial islands. Climate change has given Russia a similar opportunity in the Arctic, where they are also building out bases, setting up SAM sites, and staking claims. At the strategic level, whether deliberately or accidentally, this behavior challenges the international system. It raises questions about the capability and resolve of NATO and about the validity of America's security guarantee, the very guarantee that has underwritten the global stability since World War II. And this is what makes such behavior so dangerous. So to stop the destruction of this order, we must attempt to convince these various actors, these rivals, that this international system can and does benefit them, and that it is worth preserving and protecting. But at the same time, we must also remain vigilant and prepared to counter their potentially destructive impulses and designs should they fail to be persuaded. And this is our task. And the United States Navy and Marine Corps are indispensable in meeting this challenge. For it is the world's oceans that connect the global community and are the lifelines for commerce and communication. 80% of the Earth's population lives within an hour's drive of the ocean and 90% of the global trade is seaborne. 95% of voice and data are carried by undersea cables. So we must protect these assets and defend this rules-based order 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, on any ocean, in any littoral, from the seabed to space, across cyberspace, as well as on land, where all the people live. For these reasons, more than any time in our history, the world needs the Navy and Marine Corps. So with this as the strategic backdrop, let me turn to what this means for the Department of the Navy today. How do we ensure this future is secure? Navy and Marine Corps leaders and theorists need to focus on the operational and tactical levels in support of our strategic objectives. We need innovative thinking on how to link creative new concepts and operations with emerging technologies and we need to do all this much more cheaply and quickly. This is our challenge. Fortunately, innovation is a key strand in the DNA of the US Navy and Marine Corps. Both are used to adapting new technology as well as creating new tactics and operational art. Consider such groundbreaking new, groundbreaking new advancements as the switch from sail to, sea power, to steam power, meaning naval tactics were no longer driven by the prevailing winds or the rise of carrier aviation in World War II, which supplanted the battleship as the premier strike platform. It allowed the Navy to strike targets hundreds of miles away, an operational concept that won the war in the Pacific. The shift from guns to precision-guided munitions enabled our ships and submarines to accurately engage shore targets up to 1,000 miles away without sending manned aircraft into harm's way. 
the Navy and Marine Corps have evolved beyond sea control and seizing advanced bases to project, projecting power far inland to influence events there. In each of these cases, the Navy and Marine Corps leverage new technologies in novel ways to irrevocably alter how the Navy force fights. So what are the next new concepts, technologies, or combinations of both that will make the difference in the future? So let me start with concepts. Having been commissioned in the 80s, I am a product of the post-Goldwater Nichols era. And as a strategist, an operator, an academic, a policymaker, my thinking begins with a joint lens. So from my past vantage points as an Air Force officer and an academic, and then again in the policy offices working, working um, in the Pentagon's policy shop, I've watched the Navy and Marine Corps as they seem to generally peacefully coexist. I've noted the professional respect that exists among the naval officers of the two services. But we know that historically they have tended to think, quite naturally it turns out, about the matters that impinge more directly on their individual service, rather than on the possibilities inherent in a greater level of operational integration between their two services. And this is something I've been thinking quite a bit about since I was nominated for this job. And it's a subject I'm working hard to elevate this year. Now it turns out, to some extent, that I'm pushing on an open door. As I survey the rich and operational and doctrinal thinking going on with the department, I see glimmers of hope and real movement toward greater integration and creative concepts. I see it in the 2007 and 2015 sea power strategies. I see it in the concept for littoral operations in a contested environment. I see it in the concept of electronic maneuver warfare. I see it in the concept of distributed lethality. And I see it in the reemergence of thinking about advanced space operations. Real opportunities are presenting themselves for operationalizing a broader vision of American sea power. And I see the two services moving forward to capture them. For example, I don't think we've yet scratched the surface of just how game-changing the integration of the F-35B into our big deck amphibs could be. When I think of the power that plane will bring to the 11 decks, an additional 11 decks that can now participate more meaningfully in sea control, power projection, and maritime dominance, I see the building blocks of an integrated sea, American sea power begin to emerge. When I hear the Navy talking about a desire to add offensive weapons to the amphibious ships as a method of distributing firepower, when I hear the Marine Corps talking about wanting to put a squad of infantry and a couple of attack helicopters on the LCS, I see the building blocks of an integrated American sea power begin to align themselves. The Navy Marine Corps team has always been a force multiplying partnership that is unique among all the US Armed Forces and without peer across the globe. Not only does our Navy and Marine Corps team provide our military commanders with unsurpassed ability to conduct a full range of combat missions, but because it is always forward, it also provides our nation's leadership with an easily scaled, flexible instrument of diplomacy, able to influence would-be aggressors and regional troublemakers. So by being forward in the right numbers with the right capabilities, the Navy Marine Corps team provides the President, the Secretary of Defense, and our combatant commanders powerful deterrence and response options. Naval forces that revolve around the central proposition that globally distributed American sea power requires creatively integrated forces from the Navy and the Marine Corps will be uniquely postured and comprised for, the deter for deterrence of conflict and for rapid response to crises. As we reimagine our concepts and doctrines with our emerging technologies, we must think through how the nature of deterrence is changing and how the fine lines between conventional and strategic deterrence may be blurring in the eyes of our adversaries. This is the intellectual task of maritime strategists for those of you in this room, many of those of you in this room. In order to deliver on this proposition for more creative integration, however, the two services must continue to build on their recent efforts to more closely align, to interoperate, and to cooperate. The Navy and Marine Corps shall no longer go to sea together, but to go to sea as one. Integration also means the leveraging of new technologies. Now, some of these concepts, such as the integrated flight ops, are only possible if certain emerging technologies, like the F-35B, are fully fielded. And others suggest new ways to use old capabilities. 
Our tech communities are exploring new capabilities, the strategic and operational implications of which are yet to be uncovered by our strategists, theorists, and war gamers. These communities need to see how the next technology, operational concept, or combination of the two might spawn an operational leap in warfare. Unmanned systems, or more accurately, autonomous systems, hypervelocity projectiles, directed energy weapons, cyber warfare, or perhaps technology we haven't even envisioned for military use. Consider that distributed lethality has driven our Tomahawk land attack missile to anti-ship capability, and the SM-6, an anti-air missile, now has the capability to hit and kill ships. So once in the fleet, these weapons will provide our ships and submarines unprecedented capabilities. We also need to think through the implications of a world where technology is no longer available to just the few well-heeled large militaries. Advanced and disruptive technologies are rapidly proliferating to everyone. Our adversaries, no longer just nation states, but a growing number of transnational actors that appear and operate at the speed of the internet and social media. <clears throat> Moore's law, which suggests exponential growth per year in digital technologies, has effectively been exported, enabling our adversaries to adapt and employ technology as fast as the commercial world develops it, which compared with our overly bureaucratic and politicized processes is much faster than we usually can. For example, one very real, real potential threat that encompasses the synergy of rapidly evolving commercial technology and unmanned systems is a weaponized commercial quadcopter, like the ubiquitous semi-autonomous GPS-guided phantom drone that is present at sporting venues and other public events. It's not a far leap of imagination to envision a small swarm of these drones armed with explosives in remote detonators attacking one of our ships or marine bases. Now, our self-defenses were designed for large missiles and aircraft traveling at several hundred miles an hour, not drones less than two feet long and traveling less than 20 miles per hour. Even if we were able to target and kill these armed drones at a cost of, of about $1,000 per quadcopter, they present a challenging asymmetric threat in place, that places us on the wrong side of the cost curve. This example demonstrates that we must also be innovative in our use of resources. The fiscal pressures on our Navy and Marine Corps are real. This means that our platforms and weapon systems must offer flexibility, capability, and capacity while also being as cost effective as possible. The innovation challenge is, is how to provide the lethality we need at exponentially lower costs. And this is not something that comes naturally to us. At the R&D level, we are more focused on the asymmetries gained with the technology and capability itself not necessarily with the asymmetries of cost. The Department of the Navy has some exquisite precision-guided munitions over the last 30 years, but they are pricey. As our adversaries develop more cost-effective weapons, often leveraging commercial technology that is just good enough, we can no longer afford to trade weapons priced in the millions in order to kill $1,000 weapons. This becomes especially true if our adversary's asymmetric tactic is to send swarms of low-cost, low-tech platforms or weapon systems against our sailors and Marines. We need to get on the right side of that cost curve. This may mean adapting existing weapons systems and platforms from one-trick ponies to multi-mission capabilities that harness new, cheaper technologies with new concepts or old tech and new, innovation, in new, new and innovative ways so we in the Pentagon look to the Naval War College and those present here today to lead the next generation of war games and maritime strategy development that will identify and capitalize on asymmetric concepts and new technologies. Our naval strategists must work hand in hand with our acquisition force and the fleet to develop or adapt the equipment necessary to execute these new tactics and strategies as well as to train our sailors and Marines on how to implement them. A prime example and focus of the, of the Secretary of the Navy is unmanned systems. How will we use this capability? This is an area the Secretary Mabus fully intends to develop into a core tool in the warfighting tool bag. He has acted decisively and established two new offices, a Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Unmanned Systems and an office in the OPNAV N99. 
and they work together. And he has, ch he has charged me as undersecretary to elevate and energize their efforts as they focus on developing these unique capabilities. The Department of the Navy has embarked on a series of tabletop war games, workshops, and conferences to explore novel operational concepts for unmanned systems. And I intend to stay engaged in all of these efforts and to sponsor a capstone event toward the end of the year. My focus is to bring the various communities together, scientists, operators, industry, and others, to find the creative game-changing applications for these new technologies. And this is where your efforts will be critical to our success. It is not enough to only focus on developing the technology. <clears throat> the technological capabilities are necessary but not sufficient. We must also discuss and develop the policy, the concepts of operation, and tactics to shape and enable these capabilities. Develop your war game scenarios and workshops to challenge us to think not only about how we defend against disruptive technologies, but also about the offensive uses of such systems and how all of this affects how we think about deterrence. There are myriad areas to explore through your research in gaming. How to develop the man-machine interface to make autonomous systems a force multiplier for our more expensive and exquisite man platforms. How our existing and emerging concepts of operations, such as distributed lethality and electronic maneuver warfare, will integrate swarming autonomous systems, nanorobots, all in the undersea, airborne, and ground domains. How will our adversaries employ these systems? And how will they adapt their new tactics? Will there be revolutionary change, like the airplane or the tank, requiring new concepts of operations and theories of battle? Or will they just be a tweak to how we currently operate? Through new concepts and theories in gaming, we must shape our future, not just admire the complexity and uncertainty that our Navy and Marine Corps face. So I hope that I've adequately framed the challenges and drivers that will shape our future maritime strategy for you. Fiscal limitations, a rapidly evolving and increasingly complex security environment, and technology that is advancing and being adapted at astonishing speeds. This in turn drives our Navy and Marine Corps to become more innovative and adaptive in our operational concepts, tactics, and strategies. We must not allow ourselves to become myopic and fixated on just one threat. We must continue to leverage the lessons of the master strategy, strategists, Thucydides, Sun Tzu, Clausewitz, Mao, and Mahan, for even as the world changes, their core lessons hold true. I strongly believe in the importance of learning from the past, both historical successes and failures as we look to the future, especially those examples of unforeseen or evolutionary changes to warfighting capabilities, tactics, operational art, and strategy. History has shown us that when America is stronger, our allies are stronger, and the world is safer. So thank you again to the Naval War College for hosting this event for 67 years, and to all of you here for the work you do and for your enduring commitment to America's sailors and Marines. Thank you. Do not be shy. If I don't have the answers, Andy Krepinevich will. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, Lieutenant Commander Bobby Hanvey, a student here at the War College. Thank you for your time and your comments. Uh, they ring true with a lot of stuff that we've talked about through this year. Uh, and as a member of the Gravely Re Advanced Warfare Research Group, we've also discussed that in, in detail. Um, with the adaptable and rapidly evolving technology. Uh, one of the things that we find ourselves, particularly as operators and going into the senior leadership positions, is how the acquisition process is very slow and lethargic to get there. Can you comment on what's being done to make that process more agile mm -hmm. and shorter so that we don't have, as you said, 10, 20, 30 year lead time sometimes on some of these because the technology is evolving so fast? Sure, it is, it is a big challenge. Um, and I think you have to break up the, the acquisition thing into categories. I mean, acquisitions of major, major weapon systems like aircraft carriers, 
the replacement for the Ohio class submarine, um, you know, ships, airplanes. Those are going to those are going to be very. It's going to be very challenging to accelerate those kinds of processes. We have a um, a design process that takes takes a long time. You don't just throw a nuclear submarine in the water. Moreover, um, you have many many restrictions in in law from Congress that you have to that you have to deal with for those things to make sure that the that the processes are competitive and safe. Um, so that's one category. And um, at least in the Navy, our acquisition um, assistant secretary, Sean Stackley, has been, has been pretty crafty trying to find ways to, to at least lower the cost curve, which is another problem for some of those systems, um, and to try to accelerate. Uh, I think, though, for a lot of the technologies we're talking about today, um, autonomous systems, um, you know, swarming technologies, things that sometimes we may think could be off the shelf, um, I think that we could be a lot more clever about how we, how we do that. Um, the Secretary of Defense's initiative, um, DIUX, um, is, is designed to do just that. It's designed and um, has, it's under new leadership now, and I met with them um, just last week. Um, what they're trying to do is kind of what, we're ta what I'm talking about here today, is link the communities, the operators and the theorists with the developers that are already making things, right? And then trying to find new and, and clever uses for them and to expedite the contracting, um, the contracting processes. So they've got the contracting lawyers in a room together and they have recrafted some of the ways to do that. So I think you'll start to see some of those things coming off the shelf and into the field a little bit faster. And that's, that's, a, that's good. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, another part of the, um, of that initiative is to is to try and fail, like the like industry does, and that that works for a while until Congress decides we're failing too much, and we don't know what that line is going to be. So, um, but I I think that the the only way to do it is to test it, to test that line, and so um, I'm moderately optimistic that they will will be able to crack the code on some of those um, lower cost types of um, innovations. Um, but with the major weapon systems, I think we have a long way to go. Dale Jenkins. Uh, the, uh, as we all have been reading, the Chinese have developed a long range uh, course correcting missile called the Carrier Killer, which uh, extends beyond the range of our. Uh, aircraft on our carriers. Uh, what implications do this, does this have for the composition and tactics of the carrier battle groups and also the uh, cruise missiles that are on our cruisers that can uh, counter that uh, Chinese missile? Well, I, I think that you have to look at the, the challenges that we face beyond just, um, beyond just one weapon system. Uh, and beyond just one adversary. But that said, um, I, I, I take your point. Um, I think that some of the creative thinking that's going on in the concepts community for things like distributed lethality, as well as a, a, number, of, um, a number of capabilities that are being developed are, are, are designed around those types of threats. Um, and I'm, I'm sort of optimistic uh, about that. I think we need to, I think we need to game it uh, a lot more, but the idea that um, that we're only going to use aircraft carriers and we're going to project power onto shore the way we've been doing for the past you know, couple decades, I think, we're, I think we need to rethink that. I think um, it's pretty well known that our adversaries, um, our future adversaries, have been watching us for 10 and 20 years since the first Gulf War, since our precision guided munitions really changed the way they had to think about us. And so I think as we look to the future, um, we have to accept the fact that they've adapted to the way they think that we like to fight, and we have to not fight that way, right? So that's why um, part of my remarks very um, encouraged by a lot of the creative thinking in the concepts of operations that will challenge, um, challenge their emerging um, concepts. Uh, Captain Ozut from Turkish Navy. Uh, 
We, the first thing we were taught uh, in this uh, military school was to have independent uh, defense industry to pursue on national interests. So that was the basic things uh, of, of Turkish uh, defense uh, strategy. But I wonder your view about uh, U.S. view about uh, allies to develop strategies to pursue their interest, which does not necessarily align with the uh, United States, and to and in in, in this way, uh, they are acquiring uh, new capabilities and also exporting these regionally or globally. Well, um, thank you for your question. I, I think that um, one of the most important things that America does is to develop and maintain and nurture its vast network of allies and partners. We do this in a lot of ways, um, not just um, by sharing our technologies and our weapon systems, but through training opportunities and exercises and an array of diplomatic um, engagements. And um, my, my attitude on this is that you're never, it's never going to be perfect. We are never going to perfectly align with any ally or any partner. You're, you're going to constantly, on every single thing, you're going to constantly be having to be um, maneuvering, or not maneuvering, but mas massaging and, 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 and in constant dialogue on, on, on the changing times. So um, the refugee crisis in Europe is a great example. Um, it's existentially affecting our partners and allies in the region, and we want to help. It's not affecting us in the same way. So people have different interests, and I think that, um, I don't think that makes the relationships um, fragile, and I don't think it makes those relationships brittle. I think it can challenge them, and um, and so that's the way we need to work. We need to work on that. Now, the the idea that you you expressed about um, technologies being exported, that's that's always been part of the part of the challenge or part of the gamble of these relationships. And I don't see the United States changing. Um, changing the way they operate with respect to allies because it is exactly what makes us um, strong and safe as a global community. I think that um, there's an old saying in Silicon Valley that when technology and bureaucracy meet, bureaucracy wins 100% of the time. And I wonder how the Navy will think about the following challenge. When Barnes & Noble was $18 million, um, excuse me, four and a half billion in sales, Amazon was 18 million. The problem that Barnes & Noble had was smart people, but they didn't grow up with any technological way of thinking. And some people think the challenge for the DOD and the Navy is smart people, but no technological way of thinking. They're not the kind of people in the Navy that the old Michael Dell and Bill Gates ever would have hired. So the challenge that the Navy has is it has defense contractors giving them stuff, it has people with jobs and titles, but none of them have the way of thinking that of those that get hired by Amazon and, and Jeff Bezos. That is the time frame. So in a world where technology is the great leveler, how is the Navy ever gonna go as fast as the Chinese who are getting around that? Well, some people have an advantage over us, and that is that uh, they find clever ways to copy our technologies. Um, you are bringing up a really important point, and I'm, I think about uh, the second time I came in to serve in the Pentagon, it was, it was December 2008, and um, President Obama had just won the election. And um, I was asked to serve on the transition team in the Pentagon. And, you know, the Obama campaign had been, you know, dynamic and, you know, all these young people in Chicago and they were like on social media and it was really hip and cool. And, you know, I wasn't one of them in Chicago. I was one of the 
boring think tanky people in Washington. But so there we come together in the Pentagon on our first day, and these kids come running in, they whip open their laptops, and they're like, hey, what's the wireless code for the Pentagon? <laughs> and I was just like, do you know where you are? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's no wireless at the Pentagon, are you kidding me? But, um, and there's still no wireless at the Pentagon nearly seven, eight years later. But the point is, this is how they operated. This is how we all operated. This is how I operated when I was outside for the last four years. You know, and I, had, I have my iPhone with me all the time, and my assistant could text me and tell me I'm late for a meeting. In the Pentagon, they have to send out like a search team because nobody has their cell phones in the Pentagon, right? Um, that's just an example that I rem I'm reminded of every single day now that I've come back into the Pentagon of how hard it is to operate inside our, um, our, our secure system. Now, we do this for all the right reasons, but we have got to crack this code. We have got to find ways to, um, we can't continue to further isolate ourselves and operate in a 20th century environment inside our systems when everybody else is operating in a different way for exactly the reason you say, because the next generation is not gonna put up with that. Right? They're just going to be like, what? No wireless code? So, and that's just one example. And, and it sort of ripples into and characterizes um, the way companies and tech companies operate today. So this is one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of um, Secretary Mavis and Secretary of Defense Carter's Force of the Future and Sailor 2025 initiatives, where they really are trying to think through. The next generation is going to think differently than we do. They're going to operate differently than we do. And we have got to adapt, and we have got to change, not only in our career management um, methodologies, but also in the ways that you just described. So it's a huge challenge, and it may, it may require accepting a little risk. Um, but I genuinely do not know what the answer is beyond that. So over to you guys to figure that one out. One more time? Okay. Good morning, ma'am. Thanks very much for coming to speak with us today. I'm Lieutenant Commander Ed McClellan. I'm a Navy Intelligence Officer. Um, you started your conversation this morning um, with a, a discussion about the challenge to the international rules-based system of uh, order that was created after the Second World War. Um, and both the state-based and non-state-based challenges. And so I, I'm talking mostly about the state-based challenges here. Um, is the status quo best defended by um, a, a policy that avoids escalation, so that we promote stability? Or is it best defended by resolve and a certain acceptance of risk of escalation? Is de does deterrence work best when we are willing to ride the escalation chain all the way up? Thank you. I am so glad that that is the last question, that, 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 that you brought that up, <laughs> and that I'm going to leave you with this idea. Because as my, as my, um, my team knows, um, this is a big issue to me, um, deterrence. I'll say um, the short answer is I don't think there is a best. Um, but the longer answer is, we really need to rethink how we think about deterrence. Um, we have very sort of 20th century, just strategic nuclear ideas about deterrence, if we have them at all. And I say that because aside from places like the Naval Academy and the Naval War College and all the other PME institutions, um, people don't study this stuff anymore. So when you get to Washington and you know, people like us have these ideas about deterrence by um, prevention or, or, or deterrence by denial, right, or deterrence by punishment, the two, two types that I think you're alluding to here, um, there is just no, you can't even start the conversation. So um, I do think that uh, you know, there's a curve here where you can look strong and powerful and deter and assure your allies, and then there's a point at which you could become provocative. That's your classic security dilemma. Um, but we rode that edge 
a lot in the Cold War. And we, we have to not be afraid to write it today because not everything you do is by definition provocative. You may need, you may need to provoke a little in order to deter, right? And I think that's what you're getting at. So when we do fawn ops in the South China Sea, yeah, that's gonna provoke, but, but you know, at what cost, right? So we have to really, I, I'm, a, I'm uh, with Harry Harris, Admiral Harris in his um, endeavor to continue those because I think it's really an important thing. So my, my point is that with the challenge in the South China Sea and the challenge that Russia prevent, presents, they're actively trying to ratchet up that um, curve. And every time they go up and we do nothing, they can go up a little bit farther. They're gonna keep testing. And that's not, that, that doesn't match our normal classic deterrence models. So we have to, we have to rethink those. Um, so I charge you uh, with that. But I think your basic premise is that not everything we do is um, provocative and that we have to actually be a little more bold. Um, we do have to be bold sometimes in order to deter. So thank you.